Hello everybody, it's Marcel again, and we're going to talk a little bit about medications, specifically uh, some big terminology. And I'm going to say that I don't know that I would word a lot of stuff like they have worded on these slides. And so I'll tell you what I feel like you need to know. There's the objectives for this particular PowerPoint, so familiarize yourself. With that, you want to know what are the basic principles of pharmacology and drug nomenclature. So how does it get its name and the different types of drugs that are available out there. So um, I will tell you right now that when we ask you a question on an exam or when you do take the NCLEX, you're going to see the generic name on your exam. So um, get to know your generic name. I know a lot of times we refer to something by the brand name because it's easier to pronounce, but you'll want to recognize the generic name. And then there's some different principles of pharmacology that I'm going to try to explain in a way that are easy to understand. So I think I already said this, but the generic name is assigned when the drug first comes out and it comes from the chemical name. And the trade name is the brand that's copyrighted by the company that sells the medication. So how about, here's one that everybody knows. Tylenol is the brand name and acetaminophen is the generic name. So that's an easy way to think of it. And here's some different preparations of how drugs come and can be given to our patients. You have, most of the time you're gonna have oral medications and they come in a variety of different formats. So your capsule, a pill, a tablet, extended release, a lot of times you'll see an ER, in the name of a medication, that is going to mean that it is an extended release medication. An elixir is a liquid. Syrup, suspension, honestly, I couldn't tell you if there's a huge difference between those three. To me, they're all a liquid. <clears throat> Topical is just what it sounds like. It goes on top of the skin and it's absorbed. So liniment, which is, um, Actually, you know, it's a funny, my grandma used to have horse liniment and she would put that on our sore muscles after we worked out all day in the garden or something. It was the best thing ever. I love that stuff. Um, but a liniment is a topical, something that helps like heat up the muscles maybe, you know, and then you have your lotions, ointments, suppositories. I never really think of suppositories as being topical and a transdermal patch. So that would be like your nicotine patch or maybe um, when we put that external patch on someone's chest who's having chest pains with nitroglycerin on that patch. Um, parenteral, those are your injectables. So, you know, IM or sub Q or maybe even IV which I guess would be your infusion, that's through an IV, and implants. So I'm trying to think different implants. I would say some people have implanted birth control, an IUD, or they used to have one, I don't remember what it was called, but it felt like a book of matches wherever it was implanted under the skin. And then your different classifications of medications. So the drugs are classified by either their, how they affect the body system, how they're made up, or the way that they are used, or what the, I guess what the clinical indication is, or what they're being used to treat. And there's two primary classifications. You have therapeutic classes of medications, so um, 
that's going to specifically assist in treating the symptoms or the root cause of what's going on. Or you have um, mechanisms of action and or the chemical structure of the medication. So the mechanism of action is how it actually is working on the body and the therapeutic class is what is it doing or what is it treating. Here's an example of, did I skip a slide? No, I guess I didn't. If you go into your, your textbook resources, you can go under your Living Cod Advisor and pull up all the information on any medication you would like to see. And this was not available to me when I was a student. It's a pretty cool tool. But I will say that it, it can be quite long and overwhelming. And do you need to know every single thing? No, you don't. You really do not. You need to understand what is the name of the medication. So in this case, metoprolol. I can tell you that it ends in LOL. Anything that ends in LOL is a beta blocker. You're going to learn all these later. You don't need to know it now because we'll get into this when we cover cardiology. Uh, it's a blood pressure medication that lowers your heart rate. So it'll talk later down here about what the doses are and why you're getting it and how it works. So it'll also later get into adverse reactions or adverse effects of the medication. And if you think about it, I always thought adverse reactions were different from your side effects, but I guess they're really not. It's just another terminology for it. So your adverse reactions are the effects of the medication that happen to your body when you take them um, that are not treating the intended. So like vermitoprolol, for example, a side effect or an adverse reaction would be that you take too much and it makes your blood pressure too low and now you're passing out every time you stand up or you're super dizzy. So that would be an adverse reaction or it would be a side effect. I always think adverse reactions are those really bad side effects. And so, um, you know, if you have an immune response to the, re to the drug you're taking that causes you to go into an anaphylactic state, um, that to me is more as a more serious. So to me, that's an adverse reaction, but I think your book doesn't differentiate so much. Pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics are two different terms. And I want you to understand the difference between those two terms. So kinetics, I always think, uh, if you think, um, kinesiology is the study of the movement of the body, right? So think of this as the effect the body has on the drug, uh, the drug. So as that drug's moving through the body, what is the body doing to the drug? So there's the different um, actions that the body takes on the medications as they pass through. So you have absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. So the body affects the drug as it moves through. And there's a video that fully explains like first pass effect and um, the bioavailability of a medication. It explains it way better than I probably could, but I will just caution you that when it starts talking about the math, uh, you can probably just stop watching it because we're not gonna ask you that level of detail and you don't need to know that formula. You just need to understand that first pass effect is basically that if you take a medication orally, a vast percentage of that medication is not going to be available to you because it has to go from the mouth through the stomach and into the hepatic portal to the liver. Then the liver does its thing with it and then it gets into the systemic circulation that is now being distributed through the body and you can actually use what's left of that. 
whatever you don't use is then excreted through your feces or your urine um, at the end of the cycle of that medication. So I want you to understand that a lot of times we have medications that if you took them orally, they're not going to be very effective. So you either have to take a really high dose because it's going to, by the first pass effect, be absorbed. Like maybe the stomach acid is acting on it and then it has to go to the liver and the liver totally takes up the rest of it and you have a very small percentage available for your body to therapeutically distribute throughout your system. And then there's medications out there that I'm like, one of them would be nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin, um, we usually get that sublingual, which believe it or not, is not oral. That is going to be absorbed into the, um, the bloodstream through the buccal space. And we have that for nitro, or we have the paste that goes on the chest as a topical medication, or it's given via IV. And that's because if you swallowed a pill, it would not be bioavailable to you. So that's the first pass of it. So um, some other things to keep in mind about the first pass of it is if you have liver or kidney issues and this kind of, well, you know what, I'll get into that later. I feel like that goes along with another thing we're going to talk about. We'll leave it at that for our pharmacokinetics. So pharmacodynamics, what's the difference? Uh, we didn't really talk about this. Let me, I'll get into that in a minute too. guess I should have looked at these slides a little bit better. So some different factors that affect absorption of medications. We just talked about the first pass effect. That would be the route of administration. I can tell you that um, the quickest way that something's going to be absorbed is via IV because when we think about getting something out to the system, how do we get it there? We get it there in the venous or in the blood system. So if I'm giving you something IV, it's going right out there into the system. So there are no um, factors that really affect your absorption. If I give it IM, oh, let's see, some different things that could affect it would be the temperature of the muscle I'm putting it in because the cold can cause vasoconstriction and it decreases absorption. Heat causes vasodilation and it increases absorption. Subcutaneous, uh, you have a high fat content. If you have, I should say adipose tissue content, the book says fat. Um, perfusion or blood flow to the tissue. So if you have issues with perfusion or blood flow. And again, cold, causes vasoconstriction and it decreases absorption. So always think that. Then oral, you have the acidity of the stomach, the length of time it's in the stomach, the health of the GI tract, blood flow to the GI tract, and the presence of foods that may interact with the medication or other drugs that may interact with the medication. Um, sublingual or buccal, which is where it goes into the cheek. So under the tongue in the cheek area. You have perfusion or blood flow to the area, presence of food or smoking, the length of time it's retained in that area, and is it the correct placement of the medication. For topical or intradermal, which is skin, uh, the perfusion or the blood flow to the area where you're putting the medication, the integrity of the skin, and the ability for the medication to adhere to the skin. and um, How's the subcutaneous tissue? Inhalation. I can see a few things that could cause issues with inhalation. Your book points out perfusion or blood flow, integrity of the lung lining, and the ability to administer the drug properly or your inspiratory effort. So um, if you think about kids that have asthma, do we give them an inhaler right away? No, we put them on a nebulizer because they're not going to be able to follow directions and take that deep breath in. And other people may be having so many issues with their lungs that they're not going to be able to get a deep breath in to get the medication into the lungs where it can do the biggest effect. Um, sometimes they'll put a spacer 
between the mouthpiece and the actual inhaler. So it gives a person longer to get the medication down into the lungs. But um, those are all factors that we have to take into account when we're looking at different routes of medication. So let me look and see if I can find some other information I want to talk about about that. I don't think so. Uh, lipid solubility, pH, blood flow, we talked about that. Um, and the dose of the drug. So let's go to the next one. So pharmacokinetics, we just covered. Pharmacodynamics is how the drugs affect the body. So the pharmacokinetics is what does the body do to the drug? And then pharmacodynamics, what does the drug do to the body? So drugs can turn on, turn off, promote or block responses that are part of the body's normal processes. Um, it's, a, it's the way a lot of our medications work. Maybe you have a cell and it has a receptor on it and the medication is going to either block the receptor or fit into the receptor and take it away so it's not available or maybe it opens it. I don't know, but it does what it's supposed to do to alter the cell function so that whatever's going on, the drug can do what it's supposed to. So, mm, that's enough about that slide. So here's some adverse drug reactions. I talked about that a little bit earlier. Some side effects that can happen when you take a medication, these things can happen to your body. Uh, you can have an anaphylactic reaction, which is where you have an allergic response or an immune response to the medication. And that can be life-threatening because your airway can swell shut. Remember your ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation. This one is airway. And then breathe in and then circulation, really. Um, you can also build up a drug tolerance. So the more you take a medication, the more you need to take for it to have the same effect. Toxic effect, maybe you are taking too high of a dose or um, maybe your drug is affecting your kidney or your kidneys or your liver. So one thing as medical professionals, we definitely always have to keep an eye on is our drugs are metabolized by the liver and the kidneys the most in our body because our liver usually metabolizes it. And then the kidneys are how we eliminate the medication. So if there's anything wrong with our kidneys or our liver, we could very easily um, could very easily have a toxicity effect on the body because we are taking too high of a dose that we're unable to either metabolize or excrete. So you've got to think about those types of things when you're giving medication. So keep an eye on those labs. Uh, let's see, drug interactions. So this would be antagonistic and synergistic. So just like it sounds, I feel like an antagonistic effect is uh, for example, a lot of times if you take a medication with an antacid, um, you'll find out as we move through the semester that the antacids can block the absorption of medications. So we tend to give tons either two hours before or two hours after of other medications because it has an antagonistic effect on the medication. It won't let it absorb. Synergistic effects are the opposite of that. So, and sometimes you want a synergistic effect. So you want to give this medication and that medication because working together, for example, if you had asthma, you're going to give the rescue drug first, the albuterol inhaler. And you let that work for a few minutes and then maybe they're on a long acting steroid which is not a rescue medication, but it helps them, it helps the body maybe um, not respond to the allergen triggers or whatever's causing their, their asthma attacks. So um, you're gonna take your asthma inhaler first for the immediate rescue, get those lungs opened up, and then you take the other inhaler and those two medications work together to hopefully control your asthma. Um, so that's a synergistic effect. So you just have to um, 
know that if you're giving someone a couple of medications, know how they interact together. Because if you have a certain dose of one medication and now they've added another medication at the same time, if those two are synergistic, it could actually make them have too much in their system. It's also how people die of drug overdoses many times. So um, maybe we've all heard of different uh, movie stars who took, um, maybe they took an anti-anxiety medication like lorazepam, and then they took an, uh, let me think, what would they have taken? Ambien, which is a sleep aid. So those are both gonna have an effect on the brain, CNS depressant, and then they drank alcohol and passed out and they never woke up. That's because all three of those things they took were a CNS depressant and combined together, they had a synergistic effect that killed the person. So that's why if you look at drug interactions, you'll see many of the medications out there will say, do not drink alcohol with this medication. So here's some adver adverse reactions from metoprolol. We used this example earlier. But see how it's broken down into the different systems of the body and how it affects that system and how it can affect that system. I would say um, metoprolol opens up the blood vessels so it dilates them, which can cause a headache. When it dilates the blood vessels, it decreases the workload on the heart and allows it to slow down a bit. So you slow down the heart rate. Um, if you do it too much, what can happen? We talked about it. You could be dizzy. Anything that opens up those blood vessels could cause a headache. Vertigo, is that different than dizzy? Maybe. Cardiovascular system, it can cause hypotension, which is the opposite of hypertension, which is what we're trying to treat. So if you give someone too much of something, it has the opposite effect. So they need to titrate that dose. Bradycardia, I don't think we'll have talked about this yet, but bradycardia is where your heart is beating less than 60 beats per minute. 60 to 100 is normal sinus. Um, bradycardia is where your heart is less than 60 beats per minute. And tachycardia is where your heart is beating over 100 beats per minute. Uh, what else? Tinnitus, it's ringing in the ears. A lot of different side effects, but it breaks it down by system. And do you need to know all of these? Not necessarily. But if you understand how the medication is working on the body, which is the whole point of this pharmacodynamics, then you can kind of figure it out in your own head just using critical thinking. Well, this is gonna slow down the heart it's because it's opening up the blood vessels. So what are the different things that I might see people experiencing? Um, respiratory, the, because it's a beta blocker, there are beta cells in the heart, beta one, and then in the lungs, beta two. So if you're, if you're acting on the beta cells, you're gonna affect the heart and the lungs. So we typically try to not give somebody a beta blocker if they have asthma because it can cause bronchospasms. They already have problems. We don't need to add more. Okay, um, agonist versus antagonist. Um, okay, so you have this receptor site on a cell that you're trying to target. And before you gave a medication, this substance would adhere to the receptor site. Now I've given an agonist medication and it is competing for the site on that receptor. So now this thing over here is not getting to take all those receptor sites or I'm blocking this from being able to to um, fit here because I've sent in something um, that's just gonna block the activity. Here's some different factors that affect 
drug action. So it could be developmental considerations, height, weight, age. Um, I'm just looking through the textbook to see because there's all kinds of different things in the book too that have to do with factors that affect the body's risk, um, the effect of the drug on the body. So do you think um, we're going to give the same dose of a medication to a small child that we would to a adult that's maybe 50? We probably wouldn't. We also need to consider um, what's their, um, what are their other comorbidities? That's not listed on here, but we talked about if the liver is damaged or if the kidneys are damaged, that's going to affect the action of that drug. Um, biological sex, I'm looking at the biological sex. Um, so one thing to consider is when you give an IM injection, you have to remember that people who are assigned as male when they're born typically have more vascular muscles. So the effects of the drug will be seen sooner in someone born male than someone who's born female. People who are female typically have more fat cells than people assigned male. So drugs that deposit in fat may be slowly released and cause effects for a prolonged period. So, I mean, just simple things like that, understanding the makeup of our biology. Uh, cultural and genetic factors also referred to as ethnopharmacology. I, I'm trying to see if I can find something in the book that has to do with that particular one. Um, not seeing it, but I'm quite sure that there are medications that work differently on people from different areas of the world. Pathophysiology. So that has to do with illness and what else is going on with the person, which we've talked about. And then timing of administration. So for here's a medication. You have to give this medication before you eat food or have anything really to drink. Um, and that is if you have a thyroid issue where your thyroid does not produce enough um, hormones. So your thyroid is slow, hypothyroidism. We give people levothyroxine for that, med, for that disease. And um, that medication has to be taken on an empty stomach for it to work. So if you took it with coffee or breakfast or whatever, it's not going to work. It, it just doesn't absorb at the rate it needs to. And it, that medication has therapeutic levels. They have to watch the person's blood to see like what's the level of your thyroid hormones and is this the right dose. So if you're constantly eating, you're not getting the benefit of that medication. So it needs to be taken an hour before breakfast. So if you work in the hospital setting with older adults, uh, six o'clock, you're going to have med pass for that level of thyroxine for all of your hypothyroid patients. And that's the reason why. I also gave you another example that you could almost say is timing of administration. Um, if I give it with their um, calcium supplements, it's not going to be absorbed effectively. So it's going to be like they never got their medication because we timed it with something that was going to have an um, opposite effect and negate the effects of that medication. Or maybe I'm giving this medication too early and I just gave a dose four hours ago and now I have given them too much. So I have to know like, what does it look like if I gave somebody too much of a medication? So there's all kinds of factors. I talked a little bit about different levels of the medication. So a therapeutic range, we have certain medications that we will learn about later in the semester where we have to look at the blood serum before we give the dose of the medication. Um, so what vancomycin is one, it's an IV antibiotic that we give. Sometimes we give it orally uh, that has a therapeutic range. So we are looking for the lab to come up and draw those labs. And we're looking for that number before we give the medication. Um, so we, we need to know that it's in the therapeutic range, meaning it's the high, it's a number that's high enough to uh, improve or see the outcomes we're hoping for with our patient, but not so high it's causing toxicity and not so low that it's not working. So our peak level is what is the highest level while it's working and the trough is the lowest point um, of concentration. And then half-life is kind of a hard thing to get 
I'm going to try to give you an example. Give me a second. I'm not going to give you a specific medication. I'm just going to tell you. Let's say you have, it's, so half-life is the amount of time it takes for 50% of the blood concentration of a medication to be eliminated from the body. So from the time you got the medication, no matter how you got it, what is the half-life of it? So if the half-life of a medication is 12 hours, let's say, that's the half-life. If I give the medication at midnight and I gave you 400 milligrams, then 12 hours later, which is the half-life, if I gave 400 milligrams, I should still have 200 milligrams floating around. So that would be the half-life. Um, the part that becomes confusing is it divides in half every 12 hours. So, it, so I gave it at midnight at noon. My 400 milligrams is 200 milligrams at midnight again, because we're looking at the 12 hours for the half-life. Now I'm at 100 milligrams. And then 48 hours later, which would be midnight. I don't even know where I'm at. Let's see. I did midnight, noon, midnight. That's 24 hours. So at 24 hours, I'm at 100 milligrams. Uh, 36 hours, I am at 50 milligrams. And then 12 hours after that, which we're now up to 48 hours, I still have 25 milligrams of that medication circulating in my body. So I hope that made sense. If the half-life of the medication was two hours, then let's say I gave it at 8 o'clock this morning and it was 100 milligrams. So at 10 o'clock in the morning, it's two hours later, my half-life is two hours, then that's now 50 milligrams is circulating. Two hours after that, so we're at four hours total. Now I'm at um, half of 50, which is 25 milligrams. So the shorter the half-life, the shorter amount of time that the medication is working or going through the body. So one thing that will affect the half-life, again, is you've got to know your liver and kidney function because your half-life can be altered because it's not going to be either um, metabolized by the liver or it's not going to be excreted by the kidneys, one of the two. It might be eventually, but it just hangs around. So we've got to watch for toxicity in those patients with those types of issues. And many times your pharmacy is already looking at that, but it is also your responsibility to be watching for those things. So hopefully this all made sense. I hope so. This is a shorter video. You can always go and look at your Karch's Focus on Nursing Pharmacology, which is the book I was looking at, or um, find your chapter in the book that was assigned to you that went along with this. I feel like the Karch chapter was a lot more easy to understand.